Well, welcome to the living room here at the Golden School of Public Policy. It's great to have you here. Uh, we're here today with uh, Professor Jack Glazer from the Goldman School, who just wrote uh, an extraordinary book called Suspect Race, which is on the topic of our conversation today, and Assistant Chief uh, Paul Figueroa from the Oakland Police Department, uh, two people who have studied criminal justice from both sides, from the academic side and from the practical day-to-day -day side. But both of you have also thought a lot about the other side. You know, Jack's been involved in actually going and looking at police departments, working with police chiefs. I know you've done a lot of study and thinking about exactly what policing should be about. So that's what we want to discuss today. And we want to talk about racial profiling. We want to talk about the problems of policing and race especially, but more generally just the question of how do you do good policing and at the same time not discriminate against particular groups. So that's the topic. So Jack, uh, tell me a little bit about how you got interested in the whole issue of policing and racial profiling. Fair enough. Um, I am trained as an experimental social psychologist and was, Which doesn't put you out into the field very much. Does not put you out in the field and rarely puts you in contact with policing. Mm -hmm. um, and, but my focus was on stereotyping and particularly implicit or unconscious stereotyping and prejudice and how our biases toward members of particular groups can operate outside of our conscious awareness and control. And I happened to be reading an article in the New Republic by Randall Kennedy who's a prominent uh, constitutional scholar at Harvard and he was arguing on constitutional grounds against racial profiling because it violates the fourth and fourteenth amendments and, and it uh, violates people's basic right to be not intruded with. And, uh, but he seemed to be conceding that racial profiling would be a rational strategy because police could concentrate their resources on groups that are most likely to offend. And I felt like I was surprised that he was conceding that so quickly. And as a psychologist studying stereotyping, it occurred to me that what might be guiding police decisions about who to investigate would be stereotypes that are less formal and less conscious and may not actually lead to such efficient or effective or rational policing. And so I set about trying to figure that out and I can describe that whole process, but that's where I well, really we'll, got we'll started. We'll get into that, and, and, but let me just start with, by asking, is it a bad idea when a crime's been committed to note the race of the person who supposedly committed the crime? Uh, is that a bad idea? Is that no. what we mean by racial profiling? No, not a bad idea, and it's not what we mean by racial profiling. There are some people who will argue that that is a bad idea, but it's standard policing, and, it's, and we differentiate that, the use of race in a suspect description, from racial profiling, which is where you don't necessarily have any specific information about a crime that's been committed, but you're looking, police officers are looking for potential perpetrators. In the case of using race in suspect description, that's just a practical thing to do to help narrow down the pool. But it, it, it's important that we acknowledge that is in the case where a crime has been committed and reported, and there are police who are investigating and pursuing a real suspect, a known suspect. So, Paul, that sounds sensible to you? As a that, starting and and that's, that, that's actually quite in line with the definition of racial profiling that the Oakland Police Department uses. Of course, we have a prohibition against uh, racial profiling, and that, that is actually contained within um, our definition of it that, um, that you can use race as a factor when it's specifically tied to a crime that's occurred and it's a descriptor. Um, so in other words, somebody mm -hmm. um, comes out of a, a store and they just committed a theft, um, uh, you know, a, a male Hispanic in a dark suit and a purple shirt, that's a, that's a descriptor of somebody who just um, committed a crime and that, that gives the officers information they need as they're investigating the crime. And, and a good way to at least try to see if you can't apprehend the, the criminal, yeah. Yeah. So, Jack, um, what's wrong then with racial profiling uh, because in fact it does turn out isn't it true that there are differences? Uh, young people are more likely to commit crimes than old people, and so am I profiling if I, in general, look for young people who uh, might have committed crimes? Uh, what's wrong with some profiling? Well, um, there are many layers to the answer to that question. Uh, one answer is that even though it's true that young men are responsible for more than their share of crime across almost every crime type, uh, if we were to engage in that kind of profiling and police were to be using that as a basis for who to stop, not again in pursuit of a, an actual perpetrator of a known crime, but just looking for people who might be involved in crime, 
No, that, that, would, be, that would run afoul of the Constitution, and it would impinge the rights of young men who otherwise have a right to go about their business without, without concern for that. But it would also be irrational because that's just a really large number of people, young men. And looking, using that as a criterion for who is suspicious is so crude and blunt compared to more obvious direct indicators of suspiciousness, the actual behavior of individuals or descript suspect descriptions, et cetera, that it's not a particularly effective strategy, even if it were legally uh, constitutional. Can I, so, can I piggyback on yeah, that? Yeah, piggyback, and, and please. I think, like and, and Jack and I have talked a lot about this o over time in that, you know, it's a really important focus is everything uh, right now. And particularly as we're looking at uh, rebuilding trust and gaining the trust in communities that typically haven't had great relationships with the police in the past, and, and that's an understatement, right, in terms of um, uh, and the history of what's occurred uh, over the years. And when you look at what agencies are doing across the nation, um, particularly in, the, in, in communities of color um, and, and throughout the country, it's, it's all about trust building. And we know that the more, the higher the levels of trust within a community, the more they're willing to cooperate with the police. And so to just go out in, um, and in a discriminant way and, and just go out and just stop based on race is not uh, a helpful strategy in that in, uh, to build trust with the community if we're trying to gain um, not only voluntary compliance with the law, but also trying to gain trust within that community. So they'll help us arrest individuals who have been engaged in crimes along the way. Okay, so you give me a reason why I might not want to do it. But on the other hand, I just might say, look, there are certain stereotypes which just turn out to be true. And so why can't I use true stereotypes? And indeed, it turns out human beings have to have some way to guide their way through the complex world in which we live. And often stereotypes give us some advantage in doing that. Isn't that true? Can, wouldn't a psychologist say that's true? It, it is true. It's true, and it's a, sort of a fallacy of, the, of old dialogues within psychology to say that stereotypes are inherently true or inherently false. They're beliefs that we have about people and the traits that they're likely to have depending on the groups they belong to. And we have gender stereotypes and racial stereotypes and age stereotypes and political ideology stereotypes and all those things. The one thing to bear in mind is that on almost every measurable human trait, any two groups that you can identify overlap a lot more than they, than they differ. And so even though there may be an, on average a difference between this group that men may offend in, in certain types of crimes more than women, there's still going to be, well, that's actually not the best example because that's where the stereo, that's one instance where stereo, the stereotype is fairly accurate in terms of violent crime and gender. But in other respects, even in terms of physical attributes like height, how tall men and women are, the overlap between their distributions is much greater than the difference between them. And so again, using that average difference as a predictive diagnostic factor for trying to identify a criminal or a, or a firefighter or somebody tall enough to do something is much cruder than actually looking at the specific information. But there's another problem with profiling or using stereotypes to make judgments, especially in policing, which is that it can have a self-fulfilling effect where if the police are operating under the assumption that this group, young men, African Americans, Latinos, whatever it might be, is responsible for most of the crime, and they begin profiling them, and they subject them to more stops and more searches, they're gonna end up arresting more of them, and they're gonna actually create the stereotype by changing the criminal justice statistics because they will end up incarcerating more people from that group. So is there a way of figuring out if that's actually happened, that in fact it, we look at the statistics and we say well, there's no question but that if you look at the statistics, uh, young black men are much more likely to get apprehended uh, than young white men, but maybe that's not quite got it right you're saying. So they are more likely to get apprehended, but not conditional upon being stopped. And this is one of the most interesting things and one of the most compelling pieces of evidence that racial profiling is occurring and that it's not, in, it's not particularly rational. And that's that across a lot of different jurisdictions, including New York City, where there's a lot of data because there have been a lot of stops, among those who have been stopped by the police, African Americans and Latinos are less likely to be carrying contraband or weapons or to, even to be arrested. And so uh, it appears that the whites who are stopped need to, need to meet a higher threshold of suspiciousness in order to get stopped. And nevertheless, the minorities who are being targeted are 
be, are less productive or less fruitful um, targets of policing. So, Paul, you don't see this as a very effective tool, the racial profiling or stereotyping, obviously. Say just a little bit more about why well, it's not so useful. Well, first of all, it's against our policy. I mean, very, 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 that, very maybe the policy's that. wrong, and so we want to we want to actually get a sense of why would that be the right so policy. So, I, I think um, the professor and we and we do talk a lot, a lot about this, uh, particularly the, his his last points. Um, that when you look at um, the, the the groups of people in by ethnicity in in Oakland, uh, the vast majority aren't engaged in criminal activity, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, here, here's a real. Here's two questions that come up a lot that I think really illustrate the points. Um, when I interact a lot with um, groups where where violent crime happens, and violent crime is concentrated in Oakland, in 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 communities of color, African American and Latino, um, and and actually in some very well defined geographic areas as well, and they they have a right to be safe in their communities, and the police have to be there, and we have to do our job, and officers are working. Um, extremely hard and doing tremendous work in those areas, but the vast majority of people of color in those areas aren't engaged in criminal activity. So if you use a stereotype um, to to make a stop, you could be stopping people that aren't engaged in illegal and activity. And perhaps just wasting resources that could be better used in other ways. Absolutely, which which is why focus is everything. I mean, you really have to get into um, focusing as much on on, go, on on identifying individuals by name with specific descriptions that you're dealing with on, on a regular basis. Because, if, and, and, and the questions are one, or the comments are one, that we want our community to be safe, and we know, we, we know we need the police. At the same time, if I'm not engaged in illegal activity, I don't want to be uh, selected for stop at a higher rate than the rest of the community that is not engaged in criminal activity as well. And th those are really the, the, the questions and the, and the comments that come up that we, that we struggle with and continue to work through. Well, and, and do the rank and file members of the police force, the, the police person on the beat, uh, do they agree that in fact it's a good policy, that you really shouldn't be doing racial profiling, that there are better ways to do police work? Absolutely. And, and, and you know, we do, we do a lot of training around that. There's a lot of conversation about that. And officers really are focusing uh, to the extent they can when, when they have very specific information. And they're working really hard making really good decisions. And, and do you have a way of sort of leading them to the aha experience that yes, there is a better way to do things? Because it seems to me that most of us start from the presumption, well, you know, racial profiling, yeah, it doesn't sound nice, but maybe it's necessary. You're saying it's not even necessary. And how do you convince somebody who's out there every day dealing with really difficult situations that it's really not necessary. It's, it's about being introspective. I think one of the, one of the big issues um, right now is that, that the, the conversations have to happen. And right now in policing across the United States, uh, line level officers, uh, as you min mentioned a minute ago, and all the way um, to the upper command, are feeling uh, under attack. That this noble yeah. profession is being attacked from all angles. Um, and everything's being questioned uh, about what the police are doing. And this is really part and parcel um, a, a, of the conversation. And when you talk to rank and file officers, they give you, we've been audited for many years now mm -hmm. um, in our stops uh, because we're under um, a consent decree um, or a negotiated settlement agreement with, with, um, through the federal courts. And our, our, our stops get audited, the officers' reports get reviewed, they articulate the reasons for the stop. So we're, we are used to having our work looked at very intensely, very closely. These are conversations we have on a regular basis, but you still have these, this tremendous impact of the criminal justice system on communities of color. And, um, and it's, it's the system as a whole, and so much of that conversation is focused on officers. It's focused on the conversation of racial profiling, and all of these um, larger issues are being um, brought in to this, to this discussion, which is really um, uh, one part of, of the discussion when there's all these things about you know the, the, the criminal justice system as a whole and how individuals are treated in that that are being put into this bucket if you will um, and and that that is really leading to a, a lot of the frustration with law enforcement nationally uh, and so you think you can do better law enforcement without racial profiling because first of all racial profiling is not that effective and second of all by not doing it you actually gain the trust of the community, and that'll make the job of the police force easier. Is That's that a exactly good right. Good summary of that's okay. exactly right. Okay, Jack, you have a 
fascinating insight in your book, which says that, in fact, racial profiling could actually lead to what you call negative deterrence or reverse deterrence. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways I started trying to understand the effects that racial profiling would have was it, my initial instinct was, well, um, going back to the original story about the effectiveness of racial profiling or the presumed effectiveness of it, I thought, well, let's get some data. <laughs> That's what we do around here uh, and take a look. And it, I quickly ran into some problems there, one being that we don't know where profiling is happening. There have now been some studies. We're talking actually now about 1999 when I first started this whole process. Uh, we now know there are some studies showing that it's happening, but we can't really get a good gauge on how much it's happening where. We also don't really know what the underlying offending rates are for the groups that are typically targeted. So even though we know what the criminal justice statistics tell us, we don't know how many black, Latino, and white young men are carrying, uh, are carrying drugs, Ill illicit drugs at any given time, or weapons. And so in order to get a determination of whether profiling is effective at catching criminals and what effect it has on incarceration rates for the targeted communities, uh, the data weren't readily available, and I started running some simulations just to say, well, what would happen under m many different conditions of different rates of offending and different rates of profiling and non-profiling and equal rates of offending and unequal rates of offending between minority and majority groups. And the, the simulations revealed that the effectiveness of profiling was highly conditional on there being very radically different offending rates, which is rarely, if ever, the case. Um, and that when the, even when the, the targeted, profiled minority group was offending at a higher rate, if police continued to profile them, the long-term effects in terms of capturing actual criminals uh, were, were very modest. And if the profiling was in ex excess of the actual difference in offending rate, if police were profiling too much given the differential offending rates, it could be counterproductive and they could end up capturing fewer criminals than they would otherwise. But then I was pushed by- Well, how could that be so? That, uh, that, that's very counterintuitive. Yeah, it seems very counterintuitive, but the effect is that if police continue to profile a group who they are incarcerating at higher and higher rates, the offenders in the at-large population are gonna go down for that group. Meanwhile, they're neglecting the majority population and offenders for that group are getting a pass. So their numbers are growing in the at-large population. And they are, uh, because of the nature of stereotypes, which is that they're very resistant to change, they persist in policing a, a population that's got a lower and lower offending rate. Then over time, it becomes ineffective. It's kind of, the metaphor I like to use is sort of fishing a pond dry. Uh, and if, you, if you're in the habit of going to fish at one particular pond because you caught some fish there before, and you keep doing that, there might be another pond where the fish are proliferating and you're missing out on that. It's a crude metaphor, mm -hmm. but it's the basically, mathematically, that's essentially what's Well, what's and happening. part of it might be that the majority group that's not being profiled, so that's sort of being given a pass, might start saying, gosh, uh, I can get away with things. So, that's so therefore, reverse. why not try to get away with those things? That's what I'm calling reverse deterrence. Yeah. And I had just been modeling these things, looking at what numerically just what happens if you profile this group and their offending rate is that and you incarcerate them. But I was, I was being encouraged by readers to, uh, to consider the possibility of deterrence because that's another purpose of policing, not just incapacitation, but deterrence. And so when I included deterrence into the mathematical models, which essentially allowed the models to say, well, if a group perceives that they're being profiled, uh, that, that their chances of being caught have increased, they should respond to that by offending less. That's deterrence theory, essentially says that as a, somebody contemplating offending uh, detects a change in the cost of committing a crime, they're gonna be less likely to commit the crime. Well, when I modeled that in, it had it, to, to have everything balance out, it had to acknowledge that people uh, who were contemplating offending who belonged to groups whose chances of getting caught went down would offend more. And because that's typically a majority group, uh, you could actually see a net increase in the amount of crime. If, if marginal criminals, people on the margin of offending in a majority group, start offending more because they realize that they have greater impunity, 
uh, you could see a net increase. And we actually ran an experiment. It wasn't on real criminals and it wasn't with real crime because we can't do that in a university setting. But we did have students given the opportunity to cheat on a test. And we found that when white students thought that black students were being monitored more carefully by the test giver, uh, they cheated more. And black they students, being the, white, the students. white students cheated more when they thought blacks were being profiled. Black students didn't cheat more when they thought whites were being profiled. And I think that's partly because they just don't have a prior schema for whites being profiled. If they see t what happened in the experiment was, you know, the experimenter asked two people to come to the front of the room. These were confederates in our experiment. They were working for us. And it was always either two white students or two black students, or there was one condition where there was nobody being profiled. And, um, and she would say, I, I want to make sure there's no cheating. I want you and you to come to the front of the room where I can watch you. And she would stare at them. When those two students were black, the white students in the room cheated more. When they were white, um, nobody cheated more. And the net effect was more cheating uh, compared to the control condition where nobody's being profiled. There was more cheating when there was profiling when, than when there wasn't. So does this make sense in terms of everyday well, policing? <clears throat> so the, the difficult problem is that in, in Oakland, um, where our number one priority is to reduce homicides and shootings. And those are concentrated in communities of color. And we, we, don't, um, uh, we don't have enough staffing, and a lot of major cities face this same challenge, that, that you're, when you focus on your number one priority, that's where you have to put the majority of your resources, given, given, um, given what you're faced with. And because of that, we are going to have more interaction with African Americans and Latinos than, than other groups um, in, in Oakland while we're focused on violent crime. And that's why it's so important uh, within the context of this conversation to be as, as focused within those groups as possible because you don't want to, um, you don't want to stop people that aren't engaged in, in the criminal activity. Um, I, I particularly haven't seen the effect um, that, um, that Jack describes, but I think the challenge of the book to me is it's got me looking now, and it's, it's got me saying, you know, it's, it's challenged me to say, wow, is, is this a, an effect that, that, that is taking place, that, that is happening? What are the offense rates? Now, one thing I can measure very well is we, we measure homicides uh, accurately and shootings reasonably accurately. Um, and we can certainly count the number of gunshots in the city. It's harder to count other types of crimes that are happening outside of our purview or, or scope. Mm -hmm. And to, to that extent, um, it's really got me thinking about, you know, what are other uh, rates of criminality? Um, we call it the denominator problem, or, or um, it's, it's different terms that are used for it. Um, but it, it's really, the, the book has challenged my thinking on that. Um, it hasn't changed my pri number, the, the number one priority of the Oakland Police Department, which is to reduce shootings and homicides. But and it's it wasn't really, intended to change. And it that. wasn't intended to change that. But it's got me thinking, like, okay, well, what is the, uh, what are the effects of that uh, moving forward? Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to believe, I think, that there's got to be some substitution. That if people feel that they can get away with it, uh, my, my wife, who is not a particularly felonious person, <laughs> nevertheless says that there's a lot that she, as a white, middle-aged woman, can get away with that others can't get away with. Uh, and so that, I think we all know those kinds of things instinctively, that there are certain folks who can get away with things that other people can't get away with. And, and to the extent that the, that perception is driven by a knowledge that police are paying more attention, mm -hmm. that they're, they are focusing their finite resources on particular groups, and that, and, and that white people like me speeding in my car detect you know that I'm I can do that with relative impunity does that affect my behavior and I don't I don't think it's a radical uh, a radical proposition that that people would offend more if they're already on the margin of doing that well and I think and I think that's the importance of of the book is to really uh, begin to push that conversation at, at this very important time in in law enforcement so let's go to a a really tough subject that's mobilized a lot of protesters and gotten a lot of people upset in America over the last six months, and that's the shooting of, of young black men by police officers. Um, Jack, what does psychology have to tell us about that? A fair amount. Um, even prior to this entering such a high level of consciousness um, in the last couple of years, uh, psychologists were doing studies dating back to around the year 2000. Uh, simulating police decisions to shoot 
uh, individuals who were either carrying weapons or uh, non-weapons. Cell phone. Cell phone versus gun, essentially, yeah. yeah. And the findings have been consistently such that most people who go through these experiments uh, where they're presented with young black or white men who are either holding a gun or a cell phone, most people are faster to shoot the armed black guys than the armed white guys and more likely to make the error of shooting the unarmed black guys than the unarmed white guys. And we call that shooter bias and it's, it's measured in what we call the shooter task. Uh, I've replicated that in my study, in my lab, uh, lots of people have replicated and it's been replicated with police officers. And in, in all of the studies with police officers, police, and this is with national samples of police, they have shown the bias in terms of response time. And in some of the samples, they've also shown it in terms of that, that error to shoot unarmed blacks more than so unarmed So is this whites. just racism? I would, dis I would distinguish it from racism. I think racism is a, is a term that we probably should use more exclusively for a more overt, um, intentional, ideological, my race is better than yours kind of attitude. And what we're talking about is sometimes called implicit racism, but I think is better called implicit bias or implicit stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So I think that when police officers, you know, I can't account for every case, but I think in most cases, when white police officers shoot unarmed black men uh, or shoot armed black men under conditions where you might argue they didn't really need to, uh, that it's largely unintentional uh, and that it's not something I would wanna call racism there, we certainly have a history in America of that kind of racism, even within policing. But I think these days and the, these recent accounts, uh, we're talking about people, normal human beings, police officers under really abnormal circumstances where they're very afraid uh, and their adrenaline is flowing. And they are, and under those kinds of conditions, and it's an uncertain sort of situation, under those conditions, that's what we know from psychology is when people are most likely to be influenced by their cognitive shortcuts like stereotypes. And so if there, and we know also from the research that there is a prevailing stereotype amongst most Americans, and it's been shown empirically in studies among police officers as well, there's a stereotype associating black people with crime and violence and weapons. And so that stereotype being there under those conditions is going to contribute to the speed with which an officer makes a decision to shoot and the absolute decision of whether to shoot or not. And I think that's a f significant part of the phenomenon that we're seeing. And is police training now talking about these kinds of concerns? Yeah, we, we absolutely have those, the conversations. I think that, that these are split-second decisions. Um, and in the vast majority of officer-involved shootings I, I've seen in, in, throughout my career have been um, encounters with armed individuals um, and, and officers have made very good decisions and so when uh, officers hear the explanation you know what you just talked about it's it's hard to hear sometimes mm -hmm. and I think as law enforcement where where we're coming from is we have to we have to be willing to have that conversation um, and and like I said the vast majority of, of officer involved shootings uh, that I've seen there there's been some encounter that has precipitated that um, but the, the, once again, the power of the book is that it really says, hey, let's, we need to look at this. Mm -hmm. and, and those are just some of the things we're doing. And in specifically in training, we put officers through, um, you see law enforcement has changed over the years. They're put in a lot more reality-based training. So you're put in those situations where um, they're trying to create that, the fight or flight um, uh, mindset response. Um, for officers, so they're, they're, they're used to getting that and making those quick decisions and they get feedback from the trainers right there in the field in terms of how they reacted, how they responded. And so there's a lot of effort underway to, to really do that reality-based training to, to get into that and say, what was your decision making? The critical thinking, right? The thinking about your thinking. Um, what, what, why did you think that? What was your underlying thoughts about that? What, what was your reason for making that decision? And, and we see that that's had a tremendous impact so in um, terms across of the board. training, Jack, Say a little bit about Danny Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics, actually for psychological work, uh, has this notion of thinking fast, thinking slow. So that's part of what's going on here. If you could explain those terms and then say a little bit about how training might make it possible for people who are put in situations where they have to think fast, that they can actually, in a sense, slow it down and get it right. The thinking fast and slow um, concept is something that has been developed out of cognitive psychology primarily, and I'm a social cognitive psychologist. 
Um, and the general idea is that we have multiple levels of processing. What we're careful these days to do is not to think of them as separate systems. Kahneman talks about system one and system two. But we, what we acknowledge is that our brains are capable of operating very fast and very slow. And we generally talk about those in terms of automatic and controlled processes. Mm -hmm. And the automatic ones are the ones that are so carefully learned, so excessively learned. They're things that we've done so many times that we don't have to think about them. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's more like thinking and not thinking. And so the example I like to use is, is learning to drive a car. The first time you learn to drive a car, the first time you try to drive a car, it's very labor intensive. It requires a lot of thought and concentration. It's overwhelming, typically. It, it is you overwhelming. Just, you just feel like it's too much happening at one time. How can I possibly control right, this right. vehicle? Especially if it's a five speed. And I, so, I taught my daughter to drive, so I remember this very, very well. Yeah, yeah. everybody who's learned to drive knows that it's overwhelming, stressful, difficult. You can only do limited things while you're doing it. But as you practice and as you, get, as you automatize the process, uh, it becomes something you can do some, somewhat mindlessly so that you can focus on where you're going, you can avoid hitting obstacles, um, and, and you will even have the experience of arriving somewhere and kind of not realizing that you were going there because it happens so automatically. And that's automatization. And that's a normal human thing. That's something we have to be able to do. Otherwise, everything we do would be this labor-intensive, thought-overwhelming uh, exercise. And so we're good at learning things. But the trick there is that it took practice, and it took a lot of learning. And I think the key here is that the training, as Paul says, has to try to create these, these situations that simulate the actual emotional experience in the field. And in fact, I'll say that we study shooter bias in my lab, but only because we know that if somebody's exhibiting shooter bias, they are doing it unintentionally, and that's interesting to us. But I'm, I have been avoiding developing trainings with regard to shooting because I don't feel ready, and I don't know if anybody's ready yet to train officers in this regard, and we don't want to be responsible for training that officer to shoot slower and get killed. And so that's a really, it's one thing to train officers to avoid stopping somebody unnecessarily or searching somebody unnecessarily, but we need to get the science down better before we start figuring out how to do the training. Exactly. I, think, I think the idea on, on the part of policing professionals to create realistic situations um, that, that do raise the level of threat and the, and the fight or flight response and the autonomic response is really important um, and again, in the case of automatization, it's going to have to be heavily repeated. It's, it, it's not going to be something you can do once a year. Um, and I'm sure this is considered a perishable skill where the training is frequent. Um, but it's going to have to be done enough so that when the situation arises, and no simulation is ever going to reach the psychological heights of an actual shooting situation where an officer hears you know, bullets whizzing by or just anticipates being shot at. Um, we need the training to be extensive enough so that when the situation arises, the automatic responses are practiced and developed enough that they will help the officer to override a stereotype-driven impulse to shoot when it's not when it's not. I mean, one of the things we have the luxury of doing is thinking slow about problems. That's that all police we do officers in have to think yeah. very fast. Right. Yeah. Split second. And so, how do you feel you're doing in terms of helping? police officers get over what could be a really awful thing for them, I'm sure, because they don't want to shoot somebody they shouldn't, they well, don't I, want, I, they, I, they shouldn't be shot. Right, and I think the Oakland Police Department has made tremendous strides. It's been about 18 months since um, there's been an officer-involved shooting um, in, in Oakland, and, and we averaged five, somewhere from five to nine um, uh, per year. And so um, th there's a lot of reasons for that, but certainly um, I give a lot of credit to our training staff. Um, they do really, really good work give a lot of training, um, most of the credit, frankly, to the officers in the field making um, great decisions out there. Um, arrests are up, were up last year. Um, so, you know, it's not that interactions are lessening, therefore, you know, there's less opportunity. Um, folks are working really hard and making and good decisions, and so they deserve a lot of the credit for that. But I really think it's, a, it's an organizational mindset. And with the defensiveness that's happening uh, around the country right now, it makes it really hard. And when I talk about organizational mindset, I mean, um, where we, we have uh, weekly, uh, monthly risk management meetings, where we meet with our commanders, 
for each area. The city of Oakland is broken into five areas, one c uh, captain in charge of each area. And we talk about what, what, what are the activities of your officers? What, what types of stops are they making? Search rates and recovery rates are a big conversation in the racial profiling. What's uh, a recovery uh, rate, search rate? I um, understand a recovery rate uh, is? I'll, I'll, uh, Jack may define it a little differently than me, but uh, the bottom line is if, if you stop somebody and search them, do you find some contraband? Okay. Something that's illegal to be carrying. I think it's a fair way to say it. So, um, so we look at that and very low recovery rates um, are being discussed right now. Is, are, is that an effective tactic? Are you using your police resources in, in a good way if you're getting low recovery rates? Our recovery rates in Oakland over the last um, a year and a half or so have hovered somewhere between 23 to 28 percent uh, by group, which if you compare it to other search rates across the country, it, it's very high. But I will also admit we, we don't know if we're actually comparing apples to apples. And I know there's a lot of research underway across the country to do that. So I think we're at a point in law enforcement now where we have to just take a breath and really build a foundation of knowledge. Um, you know, Jack talked about not wanting to introduce some interventions in police training to, to deal with um, how bias may affect a decision in an officer-involved shooting because we don't have enough information to know how that would affect and, and you could get people hurt that way. Uh, and doing no harm in, in research is, is important, right, as we move forward. So we're working really hard to build that foundation of information so that we know uh, search rates. We're working with um, Stanford right now. They're doing a very in-depth um, review of Oakland Police Department, mm -hmm. um, stop data, all the stops that we do. And we're looking at uh, the amount of time officers have on to um, um, the, the makeup of the squads. I mean, we're looking, we're slicing it every way we can to really try to build that base knowledge moving forward. And I know there's a national effort underway as well that, that Jack's a part of. And so that's really important as we move forward. And um, it's uh, one of the frustrating things as a, as a practitioner is um, we'll, we'll grab one piece of data and say this shows that the police are racist or this shows that the police aren't racist on, on our side. This shows we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and it's really the organizational mindset has to right now in the country has to be we're willing to look at it. Mm -hmm. We're willing to have this difficult conversation. Um, Jack's book, um, if, if they have a hard time <laughs> Uh, picking topics to talk about in those conversations, each chapter will will, will bring will bring it out. I particularly like the one that says you're not a racist, mm -hmm. um, because chapter eight, because it's it's really important to get that across. And I think Jack's point and really splitting out the racism and, and racism and implicit bias, mm -hmm. um, I do see as different things as well um, as we move forward in this in this conversation. That that's really really important. Um, and so along with those other things we're, we're doing, we're engaged in procedural justice training in the department, which really tries to change the, the tone and tenor of every interaction we have with community members, where they get a voice in, in what they're doing. We go through that training with officers. And so it's really the organizational mindset has to come at it from every angle that you can and be willing to say at this point in law enforcement, we really have to collect a lot more data to really get to the bottom of what's taking place. So Jack, the, the you're not a racist, you tell a story about Jesse Jackson. Why don't you recount that story? Because sure. I think that's really telling. Yeah, uh, around the early 1990s, Jesse Jackson made a statement that uh, it was a source of shame for him that he realized walking down an urban street at night um, that when he turned around, to he, he heard footsteps and turned around and saw it was a white person, he was relieved. And so Jesse Jackson had the introspection to be able to say, you know, I have these stereotypes in my head too. I'm afraid of people of color as well, even though he's maybe the most prominent civil rights leader of our time. And that's because he lives in our culture, which is imbued with these stereotypes about race and crime and violence and danger. And so police have those stereotypes as well. And the important thing is to make this distinction between racism and implicit bias. And I'm glad Paul brought that up because I want to elaborate on it a little more. The message, part of the message of the book is just because you have implicit biases doesn't mean you're a racist, um, but it also isn't meant to get you off the hook. So we have to find this balance where we say, yes, you're not a racist. You don't have racist ideology. Um, we, we, you know, you should be appalled probably in, in almost every case, in fact, by being, having any sense that you had those kinds of that's, attitudes. That's right. So somebody could have on the conscious level very strong egalitarian values, but nevertheless at the unconscious level link, links in their mind between racial groups and crime and violence and the like. And, or 
you know, actually what the research is showing is that most white people have just generally negative attitudes toward black people and other minority groups. Even if they, on the surface, or, and it's not just a surface, it's not, it's not superficiality, it's just a levels of processing, conscious, consciousness. So, um, so it's important that we be able to tell people, it, this doesn't mean you're a racist and you shouldn't get defensive about it. But you're still responsible for your actions. And police officers, their actions have such major implications for people's lives that they bear a, a special responsibility for their actions. Mm -hmm. It's a burden that they, that they bear, and they have to meet that burden. But calling them racist is not going to move us very, very far along the way of getting them to it. Just, it just and, creates And, and I think part of the, the frustration when I talk to communities um, in, in Oakland, um, uh, many of which I grew up in, um, so they, they speak pretty freely to me uh, oftentimes. And it's not so much that, um, we know, you know, Paul Figueroa, we think you're a racist um, or engage in racial profiling. There's a lot of frustration that you, you haven't really, the allegations are out there. There's this strong sense that, that we all have bias, we all live with bias. Have you studied it and have you drilled down far enough to really say, is it affecting your decisions or not? Um, and I, I can say across the country, which is why we're so passionate about really engaging with um, some research institutions, because we have to build that base knowledge. It? And there's a lot of frustration that you're not even asking the questions and looking deep enough. And that's where we're at. That's what we're trying to do now. We're, we're, we're taking the best steps that we can that we know of. I am hoping to identify more that could help. But at a minimum, we will have had the conversation. We will have looked deeply enough so that we can go to our community and say, we have, we have looked at this in, in many, many different ways. Here's why we're making our decisions. Here's the policies and practices we're using, and here's how we think they're going to make, not only build trust with the community, but here's how it's going to contribute to the overall safety of Oakland. Does diversity on police forces help here? I mean, one of the stunning things about Ferguson uh, was that it was a uh, almost all white police officers, and it was a almost entirely black community. And so there was a mismatch between the police officers and the community, you might say. Was that, do you think, it's sort of on its face a problem? Is that something we need to deal with? I, yes. Um, I, and the, the problem with Ferguson as an excellent, excellent example has multiple layers. So one problem is just the perception of the community that the police, officer, the police department doesn't represent them is going to undermine trust and goodwill. So when something like the Michael Brown shooting takes place, there isn't the goodwill and benefit of the doubt that the department might need to carry out a systematic investigation. Which did investigation. seem to occur in that nearby community where there was a shooting just a, a, a little bit later. Right, so where there's greater trust and understanding between the department and the community, they're, they're going to be able to do a better investigation because it's going to be less politicized. But there's also just the reality that officers who are operating in a, in a non-diverse environment are going to be more prone to bias because one of the few things we really know that effectively reduces intergroup bias is something called intergroup contact, which is when you put people into contact with members of other groups, their prejudice declines as long as it's not negative contact. And that's also an argument for community-oriented policing. So if you can diversify a department and have the officers engaging with the community in positive ways, that's going to reduce their biases. It's also going to build trust with the community. It's kind of a win-win situation. There, there are some expenses involved, but it's, it's generally a win-win situation. I want to get back to the notion that, that um, Paul raised about uh, the apples to apples comparison, because one of the things we're hoping to do with this national justice database that we're gathering, which will involve most of the major cities in North America, is to be able not only to uh, compare across jurisdictions in terms of who's being stopped and under what, we're going to have a whole database on who's stopped but also use of force, but we're going to be doing other measures within the department, psychological measures, including measures of implicit bias. So random samples of officers within specific departments will be given implicit bias tests, and we'll be able to look in an apples-to-apples -apples sort of way across departments to see how well those biases affect actual outcomes in terms of who's stopped but also who's arrested uh, and what the long-term downstream effects are. So we will learn more about these things. I'm hopeful. So. Tell us about Oakland. Are, is Oakland 
getting better, do you think, and working on these problems in ways that's constructive and helpful? Yeah, we're having the conversation, and I think that's step number one, and to have it in a way that, um, in an honest way, that's that's not defensive, um, where, um, and, and I have found that just, you know, through, through my years of, of uh, at the police department, that just getting a chance to explain the action, here's why I took it, this is the specific person we were looking for, actually goes a long way, because when community members are, are watching a police action and they don't know what the reason for that police action is, it's easy to assign some other um, uh, motive to it. And, and, um, and so that's where community policing comes in that, that Jack was talking about. And that's where all our efforts to really build trust with the community and really try to make every interaction we have as positive as possible really matters and makes a difference so that those judgments of motive aren't automatic, oh, well, they were profiling that guy. Well, no, actually somebody called and described the you know, Latino guy in a suit with a, a purple tie on and, and, that, and he happened to be there on that block and so I stopped him and that's the reason. And, and so Paul sees himself as yeah, a, I do. That's an I offender do. type. I am He's always type. describing right, himself. Right. Uh, but, uh, but, but all those things matter, uh, particularly as we push forward with our, all the community policing initiatives. Um, we've reorganized the department into, into um, five geographic areas. Um, each of those commanders has geographic responsibility, so the community members can know the commander mm -hmm. for their area. We have officers specifically mm -hmm. assigned to those beats. And um, in our police academy, we actually start with a bus tour of Oakland um, so that people, because I'm, I'm born and raised in Oakland in the Fruitvale District. I didn't go to West Oakland that much. I didn't know a bunch about West Oakland, and I had to learn that. And so one, one of the things that we've built into our academy is we really start them off at that this is why we're getting into the job. And um, every survey I've seen, when you, when, you, when you look at why officers got in the job, and then you survey them years later, it's always been because we want to help people. Mm -hmm. that, that's consistent in, in, all, in all the research that I've seen. And it's worth um, remembering that, too, and it's because worth, it's yeah. a tough time to be a police officer in America, but I think it is true that the overwhelming reason why people become police officers is they actually want to do good things for people and make the world a better place. In their communities. And that's why getting them, take them around Oakland, they actually stop, they meet with community groups, and this is before they ever begin the police academy. And we're setting that intention early, that, that you, these are the interactions you want. This is the community. They are, um, the vast majority um, uh, care about Oakland and, and want to make Oakland a much safer place. And so connecting them early on and throughout the academy, we have community speakers coming in throughout the academy, really maintaining that connection with the community. Well, and I think that must be important because my sense is police officers see, unfortunately, a lot of really bad things happening in the world. And I think that can be very devastating for them personally and psychologically. And to the degree you can give them a chance to have experiences where they see the good stuff that comes out of what they do, I've got to believe that leads them to be better members of the police force. I think the real occupational hazard of policing is the psychological component. Mm -hmm. And you, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but most officers don't get shot. Most officers don't suffer physical harm, but almost all officers suffer some kind of psychological harm and it, because they're having so many negative interactions and because their job is to look for bad behavior. And they'll talk about you know, bringing it home and it affecting their personal relationships. So that, that to me is the major, uh, the major occupational hazard of policing more so than the physical danger, although and, there is and, real physical danger. And that's danger exactly too. why, um, you know, part of the conversation now, and I, and I try to, you know, tone it down as much as I can and, and help people work through those feelings, but being called a racist, um, and I'm, here I am, I've lost um, brothers and sisters in this job who have given their life to help others, yet the default conversation is, well, you're a racist, you're stopping um, this group, mm -hmm. where, and, and that's why I get back to the chapter eight, why it's so important in the conversation as we move forward in this, to really bring about meaningful change, not only in policy, but in training. We have got to be able to talk about this in an honest and open way, and study it in a way that, that officers don't feel defensive about it. Because I, I'll tell you, when, I, when uh, I was working in the field, I was responding to, community concerns, citizen concerns, I was, I was making the best stops that I, that I thought I could um, at the time and in a, in a real honest way. And, um, it, and so it's just tough. It's tough to be questioned and, and give so much and sacrifice so much, and particularly now with all the protests, um, giving up holidays, working these long hours, and to be called a racist, it's really important to work through that and not internalize it because it can, ha it can have a very long impact. Jack, sum up. 
Well, there's, there's something I didn't expect. Oh, I was looking forward to this discussion, but, uh, but I think I have a new insight that gets at, somehow gets at the crux of a lot of this, and that comes from Paul's comment that, um, that when officers explain their actions to citizens, uh, to, to civilians, that it's, a, um, that it's a beneficial process on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I think that an additional benefit that you may or may not have thought of is that for the officer to be anticipating that conversation, that's going to guide them to make the decision about the interaction with the person in a way that is going to be more positive. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, the old out accountability approach, which said, but if a person feels internally accountable and expects to be a, a, explaining the basis for their interaction with the, with the citizen, they're going to go into it. And, it. and this is really important because what one of the major problems with racial profiling that we have is that the courts have been fairly permissive. And as long as an officer has an articulable basis for reasonable suspicion, the courts are okay with whatever stop and they won't throw out the evidence based on the stop. And unfortunately, the courts have also essentially, the Supreme Court has essentially said, we're not really so concerned with what the actual motivation for the stop was as long as there's a valid pretext for the stop. And so I think if we can put the onus on the officer again to be thinking not only in terms of whether they can get away with this legally, but how they would articulate it to the person that they're stopping. They're going to be more thoughtful. They're going to be uh, more respectful and more responsive. And then they're going to have that positive interaction at the end of it. And it's, again, it's going to be multi and, and just one, one, of the, one of the things um, that uh, we're doing now is we've had body-worn cameras for uh, almost four years now, not fully deployed, but now we're fully deployed uh, over that span of that four years. Um, we're, the, the actual recording, audio and video, of that community interaction is something we can study now, we can look at, and, and how are the officers explaining things? How, what type of information are they providing? And that's something that's underway right now, and that's a, that's a whole new level of information that's really going to help us um, get to the heart of some of these issues, I believe, um, and at least, like I said, really let us have some honest conversations about this. So let's bring policing full circle. People get into it to be helpful and to interact with the community. Let's make sure that they really can do that in ways that's going to be helpful to the community and helpful to themselves so that they don't have this psychological burnout from the fact that they see so many difficult situations. They have the chance to actually have positive interactions in terms of what they can say they're trying to do. So thanks so much. This Thank has you. been a conversation with Jack Laser, Professor Jack Laser at the Goldman School and Assistant uh, Police Chief Paul Figueroa of the Oakland Police Department. Thanks so much. Thank you.